So good morning, afternoon or evening. A very warm welcome, colleagues, and thank you all for joining today's webinar on decoding the fundamentals of development finance. So pleased to see so many of you connected to this event and more will join also during the course of the, of the event itself. I am Maurizio Navarra, Senior Partnership Officer and Coordinator of the Secretariat of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, which is hosted by the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD. Today's event is the first in a short series of webinars led by the Donor Platform, designed to help the development community gain a better understanding of development finance and donor approaches to food, agriculture, and rural development. During last year's Platform Annual General Assembly in October, we held a session that focused specifically on the possibilities of using innovative, sustainable, and blended finance mechanisms to fund food and nutrition security and food systems. It was made clear during this session that the food and rural development community, particularly donors, are interested in learning more about different financing tools and mechanisms, as well as emerging trends and future directions in development finance. This includes, of course, but it's not limited to, the use of blended finance instruments, which are so important to catalyze investment in food and agriculture. Now, last year, we, together with the Shamba Center for Food and Climate, launched the report in this regard on the catalytic power of donor finance for food, in particular through sustainable and blended finance. Now, over the last year, this important focus on financing for food has only increased. The 2024 edition of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, the SOFI report, which is going to be launched later this year, will be entirely dedicated to financing for food security and nutrition. Likewise, next year's EFAD's Rural Development Report will be devoted to financing rural transformation. Now, the donor platform will continue working in this area, contributing to this important international agenda with this year's annual General Assembly in November which is going to focus on financing the future of rural development and food systems in turbulent times. Now, today's session is therefore meant to review the main concept and terms related to development finance, provide an overview of the current development financing architecture, outline the key emerging issues and directions in development finance, particularly in relation to the private sector and climate, and discuss implications for the future of financing food systems and rural development. We have an extremely interesting speaker lineup and I will soon be passing the floor to our moderator. Let me first state a few housekeeping rules. First and foremost, we want this session to be as interactive and useful as possible. So please use the chat box throughout the session to post any questions or comments for the speakers. If, if there's too many questions, we will select those that are most relevant and pass them to the moderator and the speakers. There will also be a longer Q&A period after the initial presentations where you will be able to raise your hand and ask your questions live. We hope this will be a beneficial learning experience for us all. Whenever you take the floor, please start by briefly stating who you are and your organization, so we know who you are. And finally, please be aware that this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website, Donor Platform website. We want to make sure whatever is said and presented today is turned into a knowledge tool that the community can use to better understand what development finance is. So welcome again to all of you. And with this, I think we're ready to start this, uh, this session. I'm happy to now pass the floor to Jim Woodhill, Senior Advisor to the Donor Platform, and our moderator for today's webinar. Over to you, Jim. You're muted, Jim. Okay, now, now I'm not muted. Thank you, Maurizio. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody, depending where you might be joining in from. Uh, we're really excited to have so many people that have uh, expressed an interest in this seminar. I think we had, what, over 250 or something register, Maurizio? So numbers might creep up a little bit as well as we go through the, through the session. But I think that really uh, reflects the interest in this topic. And I think, as we all know, there's a huge, huge financing gap if we want to bring around the sort of changes in food systems, rural development, food security that we've been talking about over, over recent years. And as Maurizio mentioned at the previous annual General Assembly of the donor platform, we did have this session on development, uh, on blended finance. But I think quite a few of us realised that not all of us were as up to speed as perhaps we need to be on some of the real fundamentals about development finance. And that's partly what has led to this, this session this afternoon, 
just to try and sort of get those of us that are perhaps more practitioners in the rural development and food security space, but not necessarily financial people, having a little bit of better insight into what are some of the key concepts, what are some of the key institutions, and what are the implications of all of that for moving forward. But we also want to have a little bit of a talk about what are some of the bigger emerging issues around financing as well. I think we all talk a lot about the idea of bringing on private capital and private businesses into this space, but there's also some, some tricks about that and understanding the finance side is really critical if we want to make that, that successful. So what we're going to be doing this afternoon is having a, a series of three presentations and then lots of time for questions and discussion amongst all of you. So as Maurizio mentioned, do please put all of your questions in the chat uh, box and we'll be really coming back to our speakers to get input. We have got a lineup of three uh, really experienced people this afternoon. So Marco Sanchez Contillo is the Deputy Director of the Agri-Food Economics and Policy Division at FAO, but also co-director of the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, Sophie. Um, and he'll be giving us a little bit of an overview of what are some of the bigger issues around financing food food security and rural development. We then have Mita Tsunami, who is the senior consultant and was previously head of private sector for UK FCDO. And she'll be giving us a little bit of a run through on what are some of the main instruments and concepts we need to have our heads around in terms of financing. And then Natalia Toshi, who is head of funding treasury in the Treasury Services Division at IFAD, uh, we'll be taking us through what are some of the different institutional mechanisms, what are all the different banks, what are all the different sources of funding, and how does that all come together. Um, and then we'll be coming back to uh, Marco for a little bit more of an insight into mm -hmm. what might be uh, reflected in the uh, SOFI report, although that's still in early stages of being produced. So um, with that, let me hand over to Marco. And uh, again, please do jump in. We'll take questions as the speakers are going. If you've got a burning issue, uh, please get as many challenging questions for the latter part of this session so we can really get it into as a interactive afternoon as possible. Again, thanks so much to all of you for, for joining us. And Marco, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim, and also Mauricio and, and the donor, the Global Donor Carafor for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, Actually, my task today is to, to walk you through a journey from why we speak about food security and nutrition and all the way, you know, fall down into financing. Uh, my idea, let me share some slides uh, with you uh, to set the scene on this uh, topic. Uh, let me just do it like this, okay. So my idea then uh, is to explain uh, precisely uh, give you some insights on financing for food security and nutrition ahead of the SOFI uh, 2024 launch. Uh, as you all know, the state of food security and nutrition in the world is, is, is a report that uh, FAO is producing in collaboration with uh, five other, four other agencies of the UN system. IFAD is one of them, of course, and then we have a UNICEF, WHO, and WFP. It means that there is a lot of thinking from these five organizations on how uh, we deal with issues of food security and nutrition. And every year we pick up a topic, a theme, a theme that basically uh, help us explain uh, some of the underlying factors behind the trends in food security and nutrition. Now, uh, I will try to present today one part now, and then as Jim explained, another part towards the end of this event uh, before discussion. Uh, and first I will speak about why are we looking at financing when understanding the global state of food security and nutrition. And that's the key question I'm trying to, to pose right now so that we can set the stage for other colleagues to come and enlighten us a little more on the financing issues themselves. Uh, so basically I need to talk a little bit about the journey of the software report. Uh, the SOFI report is, is the UN system monitoring tool for uh, SDG 2.1 and 2.2 targets related to hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Uh, and what we have seen over the years from 2017 to 2023 is a very clear narrative that is, has emerged from these reports. First of all, you know, as I will show in a graph, after many years, you know, where 
where hunger was declining, all of a sudden we see that hunger begins to increase. Uh, the other issue is that in addition to hunger, we are witnessing a lot of problems of nutrition around the world, where you know it's not only under nutrition, as we used to know, that the, the main problem of nutrition in the world, but also overweight and obesity uh, that are giving us a little bit of trouble over the world. And then, you know, when we started seeing these trends, we started to wonder what are what are the main drivers and the structural causes behind these problems. Uh, and then, of course, once we identified those drivers, we were, uh, you know, tasked to understand what would be pathways to address those drivers and try to solve these problems of hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition in the world. So then, you know, the, what I just said can be seen in, in, in some graphs here for illustration purposes. So this one, for example, is precisely tr the trend in the prevalence of undernourishment uh, and also in the number of undernourished people. And these are our proxies to the hunger problem in the world. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, after so many years declining, you know, there, there is a period of time around 2014 and then of course 2017 where hunger begins to increase in the world. And that was a problem for us, for the four five agencies producing this report. That was a problem because it basically meant that all of a sudden we felt we are off track towards meeting uh, the targets of SDG2. Uh, and not only that, if we were to project those trends in the hunger numbers, and this is based on the software report of last year, which is going to be updated this year's, uh, in this year's report, you know, when we pro project all that to 2030, we were clearly, and we continue to be clearly seeing that it's gonna be very challenging to achieve the objective of zero hunger by 2030. That was a problem for us. Uh, so, but it's not only about hunger, it's also about how regularly people have food on the table, which is food security. So by some of the indicators that we produce in the FAO, uh, which is, for example, the prevalence of moderate or severe food insecurity, uh, we also observe that there is a problem of food insecurity. And after 2015, more or less, food insecurity has started to increase in all regions of the world. And today, we are kind of stuck with very high numbers of uh, people being food insecure, you know, with no clear trend to decline. So that also poses a challenge uh, in, our, in our agendas. Uh, and again, we should also consider the problems that arise when you don't eat well. Would you experience hunger for long periods of time? Would you have irregular access to safe and nutritious food? then you start seeing a lot of problems in nutrition. So what you see here is, for example, what we presented in last year's report, uh, the malnutrition indicators uh, evolving from 2012 to the most recent year for which there is data, and then the targets uh, for 2025 and 2013. And what you can see here is also that we are not on track towards achieving the global targets in a number of nutrition indicators. So we have a problem. And because of these problems, you know, in the software report, the, the, the five agencies were tasked to understand the drivers. So behind these problems of food insecurity and malnutrition, we identified several drivers. And importantly, many of these drivers are out of the agri-food system. So meaning that, you know, is not agri-food policies what could solve them. And here we are talking about Economic slowdowns and downturns, you know, economic crisis it affect food security and nutrition, climate variability and extremes, uh, conflicts all over the world. So these are external drivers to the agri-food system. Uh, and imagine all of these drivers may be tied to very concrete agendas, like the climate agenda, for example. Uh, and therefore, you know, we had a problem because we had many drivers of food insecurity and nutrition that cannot be controlled within agri-food systems. In addition to this, we also determined that within agri-food systems, we had a lot of inefficiencies, inequalities, and so on and so forth, that are leading to a very high cost and a very high unaffordability of healthy diets for about 3 billion people. And that's also another driver, the cost of the healthy diet. And now imagine that you have all these problems and on top of that, you have underlying inequalities that are making very difficult for policymakers to address these problems, because it's very hard to address these problems when you have 
high levels of inequality in the population. Now, what have we done having determined these drivers? Well, we were tasked to understand what would be policies to address them. And in previous software reports, we, we have proposed you know, six different pathways uh, to transform agri food systems depending on what drivers or combination of drivers are affecting a country. So we were already thinking about what are the policies. And as you can see here in this slide, we have six concrete pathways in which, you know, depending on the drivers that affect the country, you would help solve the situation. So we knew what are the pathways, but not only did we know what the, the, the pathways are, but we were also thinking, okay, what would be inside each pathway, you know? So for example, if a country is experiencing conflict and climate, then you have to think about, for example, the pathways, number one, that integrate humanitarian development and peace building policies, and also be thinking about pathway number two, which is scaling up climate resilience across the agri food system. So we knew about this pathway, we proposed this pathway, and then we thought about what would be inside each pathway. And here, you know, what we came up uh, about uh, with was that, you know, the perspective that given that many countries are affected by more than one driver, you know, some countries are affected by all of them at the same time, uh, it was important to formulate portfolios of policies, investments, and legislation, you know? And, and, and this was very important, and we did propose those portfolios. And key elements in those portfolios of policies, investments, and legislation were, for example, a very concrete policies that had to do with the agri-food system itself, but also we thought about the necessity of, you know, policies in other systems beyond the agri-food systems. Social protection, for example, was very important, health systems policies, and so on and so forth. Plus, of course, very important conditions that must prevail, like good governance and institutions and the availability of technology, data, and innovation. In a nutshell, the software report has been proposing already solutions. Now, to finalize, before I go into part two later on, uh, these solutions exist. And the question is, so why do we continue to have a problem in food security and nutrition? Well, because perhaps we haven't been thinking enough, you know, in the linkages between food insecurity and malnutrition and the lack of finance. And the lack of finance in the SDG agenda is part of the means of implementation that needs to be sorted out in SDG 17, which is finance and financial inclusion. So this is how, from the whole problem of food security and nutrition, we have navigated through the software report into solutions. But we were not thinking a lot about financing. And this kind of engagement that we're having today is what exactly we need to start brainstorming, how to connect the dots between food security and nutrition and financing. Thank you for now. Over to you, Jim. Is Jim muted? Oh. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marka. Um, so just a question here coming up about where those pathways actually come from. Could you just clarify that for us? Sure. So basically we are talking here about uh, documents, reports that emanated from 2017. So it's a few years research. And this, these pathways have been built based on original research of the five agencies, plus consultations that we did through the Food Security and Nutrition Forum in FAO, where you have a big membership of 10,000 plus, uh, plus, of course, all the evidence that is being you know, generated from the operations of the five agencies at country level. We know what works. You know, there is already evidence, impact evaluation of what works. The problem is how do you come up with those pathways and the policies and the legislation and the investment that are within each of them at scale, you know? And when we talk about this kind of pathways implemented at scale, you know, we need to talk about financing them to understand how we can back them up. Great, thanks, Marco. And I mean, just order of magnitudes. I mean, how short of cash are we to, to solve these problems? I mean, what scale of investment do we need to be to really thinking about and, and, and broadly, where does that need to come from? That's the question that Sophie answered, so I can <laughs> answer it for you right now. Uh, 
but but later on later on i can i can give you more insights into 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 the fact that there is a huge gap uh, the plumbing is there is a saying there where we say that you know you cannot manage you can, what you cannot measure right yeah. uh and i think that we shouldn't be too quick and jump into numbers we cannot really measure properly financing mm -hmm. so it's very important to start from there and understand mm -hmm. are we in a position to really estimate how much financing is really needed Mm -hmm. Maybe yes, maybe not. And that's what Sophie Report tries to answer this year. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thanks, Marco. So we'll we'll come to Mita, that, who's going to um, talk to us a little bit about what are some of the basic instruments and concepts around financing. But I think the really big message here is that we have to think much more carefully about integrating a whole range of different financing and working out how different forms of financing from different areas can leverage off each other and also really up the coordination uh, in terms of how those different forms of financing are working together. And of course, that's one of the big interests of the global donor platform in thinking through the whole uh, coordination and particularly how investments from donors can help to be to be more catalytic if they really have a, a deeper understanding of how these instruments work. So Mita, thanks so, so much for, for joining us. I know you've got a tremendous background in, in all of this work from your experience, uh, particularly working on the private sector side of work with, with FCDO. So uh, over to you uh, over to you to uh, give us some of the basics. Thanks, Jim. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on this platform. I'm going to try and share my screen. Give me a moment. Uh, can you let me know when you can see it, Jim? Uh, we can, but Nana, you need to put it on slideshow. Sorry, I'll try that again. If the button was stuck. Don't worry. It doesn't matter how many times we all do this, it still <laughs> pesters us. As you, as, you, as you can see by me always forgetting to turn my mic and my camera on. Give me one more second. I'll try that again. Ah, uh, now down in the bottom, down in the bottom right, bottom corner. Yep. Okay, this should work now, hopefully. Yep, that's that's working Thank perfectly. You. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. So, um, uh, it's great to be here this afternoon. Thank you so much for everyone to joining as well. Um, I come to you from a very hot and sunny London today, which is hosting London Climate Week. Um, so I'm going to just take you through essentially a one-on-one on financial instruments. Uh, you know, what are the kind of, uh, to get a real basic understanding of what financial instruments there are out there and how they could apply to development finance, um, uh, you know, uh, constraints and, and issues um, writ large. I'm not an agri-specialist, uh, so I would, um, I, I hope you bear with me as I kind of um, speak mostly about how the instruments work and I hope that you and others in the audience will be able to jump in if there's uh, any questions or any anything specific that you want to uh, want to share. Uh, so let me start with essentially what a typical capital structure looks like when we pull together a private sector instrument. There are three key blocks in a typical capital structure. The first is equity. You then have debt, which sits on top of equity. And then you have a hybrid of that debt and equity, which is called mezzanine finance. And let me take you through each of these to give you a sense of exactly what it is that they do, what is it that they um, provide to a capital structure and why, why it is that they're so important. So firstly on equity. So equity is the basic building block of a capital structure. And by the way, when I say capital structure, I mean how a firm or a fund or a project is financed uh, with the private sector. So equity is the basic building block and in essence, it is ownership. So anyone who provides equities to a company, for instance, will essentially own a certain part, a, a part of that company, own shares in that company for which they will get dividends. But critically, 
they share in the growth of that company. So it's the most risky part of the capital structure. It's the money that comes in first and is needed first. And if a company was to close or a fund wound up, it's the money that goes out last. So it's the riskiest part of the capital structure. And therefore, from a development perspective, uh, a very crucial part of the capital structure. There's lots of different types of equity, um, equity structures out there. That you can have ordinary shares, preferred shares, lots of different types, and they all differ in um, their characteristics. So, you know, some they'll have different voting rights or different dividend preference, but in essence, they're an ownership stake in a company or a fund. Um, it's it's critical to have the equity um, um, piece of the capital structure in because without it, you can't raise debt. Without it, you can't start. So um, it's quite a critical part and it's the highest risking, risk taking part. The next is debt. And this is something I'm sure most people are very familiar with. It's a financial obligation on the company to pay back, it's essentially a borrowing. There are lots of different types of debt instruments and they all have certain characteristics. They have a principle, which is the amount of money that is loaned or, or um, uh, they have different tenors and maturities. So you have short-term debt, which could be six months or up to three years. You have medium-term debt, five to seven years. You have long-term debt, 10 years. Sometimes in infrastructure investments, we'll see really long-term maturities of 15 years, sometimes 20 years, et cetera. You have the interest, which is essentially the cost of the company of getting that um, um, debt. Again, here, interest ranges from pure commercial interest to highly concessional interests. So IDA, for example, the World Bank's IDA provides debt on very concessional rates. Um, debts then, the, another characteristic is the repayment terms. So when is interest paid? When should the principal be paid? In what blocks should it be paid? There are covenants, and that broadly defines what is it that the debt will be used for. There are certain conditions upon which the debt is provided. And in some cases, not all, some debt providers ask for some collateral. These usually tend to be assets that you can, you can give up to the debt provider, which gives that debt provider a little bit of comfort that in the future, at some point, if something happens and this, this entity cannot pay back this debt, I have collateral, which I can then liquidate. So debt is a really important part of the capital structure. It builds on equity and it's typically used to finance growth stages. So early stages, typically debt equity, and then the growth stages, typically debt. And there are different types of debt instruments. So loans are very kind of uh, normal, typical debt instruments. Um, there's bonds, commercial papers, impact bonds. I'll just say a couple of, spend a couple of minutes on impact bonds because I know this has come up a lot in the conversations about, uh, in, in, in terms of innovative finance. So an impact bond is essentially a bond that is uh, paid when specific impact objectives are met. Now, in a typical bond or loan, you'd have the person providing the loan, let's say the bank, and the recipient of the loan, the company. And they agree the terms of the loan, and, and that's it. The money flows, and the repayments flow as agreed. In an impact bond, you have a slightly different ecosystem that governs it. So where an impact bond typically works, and we've seen this in the education sector, we've seen this in the health sector, quite a few sectors now, and uh, you're starting to use impact bonds. So in an impact bond, your investor will provide the money up front. And, and when they're providing the money, they'll make an agreement with you on what are the key impact metrics, which are clearly identified and measurable that they will, uh, that you do both agree on. So if it's in the education sector, for example, it will be how many children do we want educated? How many teachers do we want hired? How many schools do we want built? Whatever it is that they agree up front. And then that money flows through the service provider, which could be an NGO, it could be any type of development agency that's out there implementing projects. These projects are then implemented. And then when the outcomes have been achieved, so when the children, you know, there's bums on seats in classrooms, when the teachers have been hired and have contracts, or when the schools have been built, or the sanitary um, facilities around the schools have been built, whatever those impact metrics are, when they have been achieved, that is when the money then flows. And the money can be provided then by um, impact investors, by governments, whoever has entered into that contract. But another critical part of the ecosystem of an impact bond is you need independent evaluators who can come in and assess and verify that the impact metrics have been achieved. So impact bonds are really growing popularity in the innovative climate space. And they're best used where you have 
impact metrics that can be very easily um, identified, measured, and evaluated. So those are the two critical parts of the capital structure, debt and equity. I'll spend a couple of minutes on mezzanine finance. And mezzanine finance sits in between the two. So it sits above equity, below debt in the capital structure. It is, and 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 as it says on the, uh, you know, as it says on the tin, it's essentially combines elements of debt and equity. And a typical mezzanine finance structure is convertible debt. So you provide debt at a particular interest rate, but at certain, if certain conditions are met, that debt will turn into equity. So it has both features of debt and equity. And there are lots of different types of mezzanine finance. And this is where you can get really creative uh, in your capital structure. And then we turn to, it's, this is your typical capital structure, your equity at the bottom, your debt at the top, and the mezzanine in the middle. We have in the development finance world, a couple of add-ons that are typical that we see. One is grants. So can grants can come in two ways. It can come in at the bottom as seed capital. And you'll see this a lot, even in, in the ag space, where, where you have an initial untested model or a new innovation, different startups, where they come in and they, uh, they uh, uh, a grant provider will provide the seed capital for that innovation to be tested and piloted and taken to market. And it's usually when the risk is high, when there's some, it's either a risky environment or the innovation or the business model is new. Um, when the, uh, if that uh, project is successful, there is an option for that seed capital to be converted into equity or even returned back. Um, and so this is a very typical structure where the use of grant is used to stimulate activity and to seed a company or seed an idea before it becomes viable. Um, and you have then the option to benefit from the upside by, by, by converting your grant into equity or even indeed kind of getting it back when it's, uh, when it's successful. And one space where you find this very common is in the infrastructure space. So you may have heard of viability gap funding in the infrastructure space. So this is essentially what this is, where a project up front, like a big infrastructure project, like a port or renewable energy or a road, economically viable, but not yet financially viable. So not yet at a place where private investors can come in and say, yeah, we want to invest in this project. So a grant is provided by government or a donor or an entity, and they will cover part of the upfront project costs. And then it makes the project financially viable for a commercial investor to then come in at a later stage. So usually it's sequenced in time as well as uh, within the capital stack. The other place where you could find uh, grants is um, outside of the capital stack as technical assistance. And I think most people will be very familiar with this. This is grants that can be used for feasibility, for design, for upstream regulatory work, policy work, or to support certain aspects of deepening the impact of a project. So if a project is commercially viable in a certain way, TA can come in and help that project deepen its impact by, for example, going to uh, down the economic pyramid to poorer communities to serve them as consumers or employees or um, uh, or part of the value chain. So this is how grants can be added on, tapped on to the, to the capital structure. Another development add-on, it's not really a development add-on, but we see it a lot in the development space, is guarantees. And again, guarantees can be provided both as debt guarantees and equity guarantees, although debt guarantees are much more um, common that we see. And what the guarantee essentially does is say, okay, here's a lender who wants to put in some money into a project. And that lender is really concerned about the risks. So a development agency can come in and say, right, we will guarantee your debt. So we will ensure that, um, you know, 50% of your debt will be returnable to you if the following risks emerge. And so that gives some comfort to the debt provider to say, okay, I am. I can see that this is a risky debt investment. I want to back it and I now have some protection from a guarantee. So it can either reduce the risk, sometimes it's used to lower the price. It definitely enhances the credit worthiness. So with a guarantee, a company can go to a bank and say, look, I've got a guarantee. So now you can reduce the price of your, of your loan to me. Um, and, and in that way can attract and mobilize private investment. On the other side, equity guarantees are a little bit scarcer, um, but essentially they can be used to guarantee the minimum return for the equity investors or um, guarantee provide a first loss guarantee or say, look, we guarantee that you'll get at least your capital back, even if you have make no other money off the back of this. If there are any losses, we will cover we will cover it up to up to the amount of capital you put in. Uh, political risk insurance is a type of equity guarantee as well. Um, 
So that's the basics of the instruments. Um, let's apply that a little bit to this whole conversation on blended finance. Um, a really good source of information for blended finance is the Convergence website. Convergence is a, a, an agency that is essentially a thought leader, an aggregator, an analytic uh, place for analytics and data on, on blended finance. Um, so what is blended finance? Blended finance is essentially a tool through which we achieve development impact primarily by mobilizing climate cap climate um, private capital. So we use grant money in blended finance to blend with commercial money to achieve an outcome. Um, and this is how, so you, instead of spending, let's say 10 million on a project, you can spend 3 million, mobilize the 7 million um, so you're only using 3 million of donor money to just mobilize 7 million to achieve the 10 million need for a project. And the critical thing about a blended finance transaction is um, that it allows people with different objectives to come together. So a commercial investor is looking for financial return. A donor is looking for social impact. And the two can come together and, um, uh, 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 and still those two different objectives can work together to achieve, achieve the outcome. Um, and why blend? Blend, as I said, is using so that we can use certain uh, smaller amounts of donor financing to achieve the same or greater outcomes by leveraging a huge amount more of private capital. And blended finance is needed because there are barriers to commercial capital coming in directly by themselves. Uh, the key high level barriers are that often there's high risk and some of that risk is real, some of that risk is perceived. And also in certain areas, there are poor returns relative to the risk that they're taking. So blended finance comes in, it affects the economics for the private investor such that he is he or she is then willing to take the risk uh, to make that investment and therefore boost the resources available for that impact. I should say upfront, blending doesn't work everywhere. There has to be a financial um, viability of the underlying project. I'll come, that, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so there are different blended finance structures. I've covered this a little bit when I talked about instruments, but let me just very briefly go through it um, so it's clear because these are terms that you will hear a lot when you hear when you when you um, when you hear about uh, uh, innovative finance. So the first is concessional capital. This is the the most common type of capital um, blending. Concessional capital is when you put debt or equity alongside um, cheaper debt or equity alongside commercial debt or equity, so that the combined um, pool of capital is, um, is cheaper and more financially viable. So this concessionary capital can be in the form of subordinated equity, first loss equity, lower return seeking equity, um, subordinated debt, et cetera. So if you look at the uh, diagram on the right, the top, the top box is what it looks like. It sits underneath the commercial equity so that it takes the first hit and it's yeah, and it's uh, on return side. It, it's it's the last to receive its returns. Guarantees I've already mentioned um, in a lot of detail, so I won't go into detail. But basically, it's guarantees or risk instruments that sub sit alongside the capital structure that boost the terms of that equity or debt. And grants, as I mentioned, it's often it sits outside the capital structure, or if it's in the capital structure, it's come first as seed funding. Um, uh, Mita, just just watching time here a little bit. So I think another five minutes, a little bit, a little bit more. But we can also come back to some of the details in the discussion session. Great. Okay. Now, thank you. Thanks. Let me just say this: that um, I won't go into too much detail here, except to say, look, any optimal structure depends on a whole variety of things. So there is not one blended finance structure that works for everyone. Even within a particular sector, it depends on you know, the type of entity, what it's trying to do, where the innovation is, what the use of proceeds are, what stage of growth the company is, what country it is in, which market it is in. So it's a huge amount of things to consider when you're pulling together a blended finance structure. The key issues on a blended finance structure, the overall structure should be about achieving impact. Even though the private investors are there simply to get some sort of financial return, the overall structure is about impact. Otherwise, why deploy very scarce grant funding? Two, um, the transaction should yield a positive return. This is so critical. And it's, it's important because the first question you have to ask yourself is, is there a possibility that there is a financial return here for the transaction? Otherwise, it's not suitable for using private sector instruments. And third, the, the public 
grant or the public or the philanthropic um, money that goes in there is is supposed to be catalytic, i.e. it should be there to leverage in private sector, uh, not crowd them out. Uh, MDBs and DFIs have come up with these five principles for the use of blended finance. Um, you know, maximizing impact, making sure there's financial additionality, minimizing the amount of concessionality and making it time bound. I think in the ag sector, number four is very critical. We've seen in other sectors and there's lessons to be learned from other sectors like off-grid solar and others where you could very easily get into a trap where you use blended finance essentially to prop up industries which are inherently not commercially viable. In which case you just get into an endless cycle where only blending is that required to achieve uh, to mobilize private capital, and without it, you will never mobilize private capital. And there's no demonstration effect, so you enter this kind of negative cycle. Um, I'm gonna. This is a. Why don't I skip over this because it's an example of a brand finance structure I was involved in that shows you how the equity stacks um, sits. But I can come back to that if there's specific questions. Um, a couple of things on the trends within the ag sector. So one is that there is, um, there is blended finance in ag is growing globally and Sub-Saharan Africa, LATAM and the Caribbean seem to be the two regions where it's concentrated. But in these regions, the trend is falling. Um, uh, and, and you can see that in the, in the top chart. In the bottom chart is interesting to see within agriculture, where is blended finance focused? And predominantly, it's in the kind of farm productivity, agri input space and the agro processing space. And you can see why, because these are places where you can see more financial commercial viability starting to emerge. But interesting, in 2023, um, a massive increase in the amount of um, funding towards climate resist resilience and sustainable agriculture. And there's a lot more conversations now about how you can blend in that space, which I think is quite exciting. And finally, um, even though there is a growing number of blended finance transactions coming on board in ag, you can see on the right hand side that there's still only a very small proportion of that is mobilizing commercial investors. So this is a challenging sector to do, you know, to, to mobilize the private sector. And a lot of that sliver at the top that you see on, on commercial investors, a lot of that is the businesses that have in invested in their own business. Um, but we hope to see these trends changing over time, uh, particularly in Africa, because you're seeing a lot of very interesting activities happening in some of the more developed uh, economies in Africa. Let me stop there. I'm conscious that Jim might, uh, 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 you know, uh, it's got me on a clock. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions and we can take take questions then. Great, thank you so much, Mita. That was great, and some uh, very, very nice comment here. This blended finance course is brilliantly delivered, so thank you. Um, maybe we can just see whether anybody in the audience has got any questions that they'd like to ask for clarification at this stage. Um, so jump up, put your hand up, um, or uh, put a question in the comment. I can see uh, Radio, you have a question. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Jim, and. Thank you, Mita. Very nice to, to see you again after a while. Um, I wonder if you could uh, clarify that uh, leveraging uh, private sector finance uh, in the various ways you, you mentioned, uh, always there need uh, a, a private sector entity to do the, the work and to be the target of the, of the financial scheme. And, uh, and whether there are ways that public sector spend can be funded anyhow by by the private sector, which I doubt, but uh, <laughs> it's a recurrent theme. Can I just clarify you. your question? And, and it's lovely to see you again. Um, can I clarify are you saying basically, can the public um, spend within a capital structure come from the private sector? Yeah. Yeah, this is some, an assumption that uh, um, people have in the say development industry uh and uh, and i think uh it needs a little bit of uh the mystification or at least clarification so i think in most cases that i've seen blended finance structures have public financing in there but public financing is a broad let me not say public i said development financing because that's a broad bucket right it could come from donors it could come from philanthropy it could come from dfis providing concessional terms uh, and some of them do provide them. They have ability to do that, although it's it's relatively rare. 
but I can't I can't see a uh, unless it's coming from um, philanthropy or CSR budgets that the private sector um, would would come in into a blended finance structure unless the 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 concessionality is commercially priced. If the concessionality is commercially priced, then they would be willing to come in. However, sometimes and particularly in sectors like ag, that defeats the purpose uh, because then the overall structure becomes too expensive to achieve the impact we want to achieve. Great, thank, thanks. I mean, just just there, I imagine you could could see where maybe a private sector is contracting NGOs to help deliver something that is basically funded through a, a financing mechanism, particularly if you've got a private sector player further up the value chain. Would that would that be right, Mita? Yeah, so they could do it as part of their business development. Yep. They see that there's some yep. commercial benefit at, at, at coming up front, yep. yeah, or yep. through CSR budgets. Okay. I'll ask you to share where that financial information came from in the chat. But another question here, uh, any other innovative financial instruments we should be thinking about? Um, so I, I mentioned impact bonds. I think that impact bonds and guarantees would be a very interesting one to think about in the ag sector. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not an ag specialist, but I can see that this is compared to other sectors which are more commercially viable, one where commerciality is slightly difficult. Uh, I think in typical blended finance structures in the ag space, you need some technical assistance if you're trying to get to reach the poorest or the margin, most marginalized. Um, I think, you know, the bottom line is the instrument itself depends on how you play around with the building blocks. So, you know, how much equity, how much debt, how do you structure your mezzanine? Is there a role for guarantees? Is there some role for grants? That's basically where the innovation comes from. There's no magic bullet outside that. All of this is basically a play on debt, equity and grants. It's just how do you put the pieces together in a way that really kind of makes uh uh, creates value for the proposition. And I, when I, sorry, and I say, I think this is an important point. When we talk about achieving impact in the use of blended finance, there are two things I think are, which should be front of mind. Number one is how do you structure it so that you achieve the right impact? Number two is what happens afterwards? Are you creating a signal in the market that this, this, this space is just commercially unviable or are you actually demonstrating that there's some commercial viability here? And that demonstration effect is so critical because that's how we build markets rather than crowd them out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mita. I think that was a really great overview. So I think what we'll do now is we'll come back to be able to have a deeper discussion around how all of this fits together. But I think the next part of our, our story for this afternoon is uh, to hear from Natalia uh, more about, okay, so where does the money um, actually actually come from? So Natalia, over to you. And my apologies, I think, for pronouncing your name wrong the first time round. It's Toski, not Toshi. <laughs> Perfectly fine. So now I have the first challenge and I will have to manage to share my screen the right way. <laughs> okay, so while you're, while, you're, while you're getting your screen all sorted, we can ask everybody else on the call to just think a little bit about what are some of the challenging questions they would like to have in the latter part of the, the seminar. Okay, now I'm going to do this and we should be all set. Yep. Can you just confirm, Jim? Yep, that's all working perfectly. Great. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And again, it's a pleasure to be here also from my side. I'm uh, head of funding here in IFAD. And uh, after having heard such great presentations, I here have the task to essentially put it all together and say, okay, who are the players in this space? You know, who are actually the biggest or largest, most important institutions that are supposed to help the world, you know, reaching the SDGs, closing the financing gap, and actually offering all of these instruments that Mita so eloquently talked about. So I'm going to try to cover these seven aspects. And let me start straight into trying to put a little bit of order in a space where I think sometimes, you know, acronyms and definitions get a little bit messy. So what I've tried to do here is to put a logical order in <clears throat> all of these names of these different actors and these different development institutions so that they make a, a bit more sense. And by all means, there's a lot of debate around, you know, how to use the right definition for the right um, institution. But I think this scheme here at least gives us a logical uh, flow to follow. 
First of all, what is an international financial institution? I would say IFI is like the biggest umbrella term that we can use. And as I said here, an international financial institution is a financial institution, so an institution that provides financing that has been established by more than one country and therefore it's subject to international law. Now, you might think that this is like a trivial aspect of it, but believe me, it has huge <laughs> operational implications. And I'll make an example. Whenever you work in an IFI, which of course covers, for example, also EVA, you will say, I am not subject to any national law. But of course, we're not working in isolation in the world. So whenever you need to close a contract, whether it's a contract with the smallest vendor or it's a huge contract with a, with a private sector counterpart, you start having very long debates about what kind of legislation and what kind of law this contract has to be closed under. And that are the implications of having, you know, institutions that, gov that are governed by international laws and have privileges and immunities that need to be preserved. Anyhow, under the big IFI umbrella, I can see the first big distinction between multilateral development banks and development finance institutions. And then branch further down, we will see it later on, under MDBs, we will have global development banks and regional development banks, while under DFIs, we can have international DFIs and national DFIs. Now, let's start with the famous MDBs. So let's just unpack the term and see what we mean by that. Multilateral is, first of all, it means that they are established by several, several sovereign states that are shareholders of these banks. Now, of course, Mita talked about shareholders before, you know, in the capital structure. We have to specify here that indeed member states put capital into those banks, but these banks being development banks, they don't distribute dividends. They are banks, but they don't distribute dividends, which goes straight into the second point, you know, development. The mission of these banks is really not to get rich and make the most amount of money and distribute dividends to the shareholders, but they have a development mission, which is focused on fostering economics and social progress in developing countries by financing projects that support development issues. Now we have the SDGs, of course, that were introduced, and we have these 17 sustainable development goals that kind of provide a framework for looking at the biggest development problems before we had the millennial development goals. But I mean, these institutions are focused on social and economic development, which leads to the third point in specification. The MDBs are still banks in the sense that they borrow money and lend money and they make a margin out of it. But development banks are not for profit institutions. So the margin that they actually make is to cover the administrative costs of having the running business, essentially the salaries, all of the expenditures. And they have really precise formulas as to how they need to price their loans so that they can cover their own costs, which means that these banks are actually not reaching out to members to basically replenish them to cover the administrative costs. They have an element of self-sustainability when it comes to the overhead costs. And that's a distinction between other institutions that we'll get there. So these are the MDBs. Now, of course, here, you know, just to make an example of the most famous ones, I don't think they will come as a surprise to any of you. And I think we even have colleagues from them in the call. Um, the first one that is always mentioned is the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development which is part of the World Bank Group, and it was founded actually in 1944. And that was, you know, the initial mission really was to reconstruct Europe after the World War II. Now, of course, um, it's focused on global development, so it operates around the globe. But at the time, you know, when it was founded, for example, my country, Italy, was a recipient of funds from IBRD you know, to help reconstruct Italy and Germany after World War II. Then what happened is that we graduated out, so we're not eligible anymore for, for financing from the from IBRD. But that was the first goal. Then we have uh, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector window, private sector arm of the World Bank Group, which focuses on financing directly the private sector, whereas IBRD actually finances sovereign states. So the money that is given by IBRD is going to the state and then the state, you know, uses that money for implementing development projects, whereas IFC finances directly the private sector. Then we have the European Investment Bank, which is huge <laughs> also, 
And the European Investment Bank was was um, funded in 1958. And actually, the original goal was really to have equitable, equitable development in Europe. So it was there to provide financing to regions in Europe that were less developed so that, you know, we could support Europe's region as a whole and integrate the European markets. Now, EAB is currently active in 140 countries, so you can see how then from the original mission, <laughs> there's been some branching out there as well. These are multilateral development banks. Then we go into what we call the regional development banks. As, as the term implies, and we have some examples here, these are banks that focus on development on a specific in a specific region of the world. So the Inter-American Development Bank focuses on Latin America and the Caribbean. The African Development Bank focuses on financing the African continent. The Asian Development Bank is fo focusing on Asia and Pacific. And then last but not least, we have the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development that was actually funded after the Cold War. And it was really basically to um, support Eastern European countries to transition to a market economy. So... Again, these are big examples, uh, the, the, some example of the biggest ones, but I've listed here, there's many more. And actually, interestingly enough, well, interestingly enough, they, they continue being, being created and funded. Actually, the last one, the most recent one is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that was just recently funded in Beijing in 2016. Quick, so quick question, are, Talia, is the, are the regional banks funding both sovereign and private sector or not? I'll get there later on, but okay. yes, in a nutshell, yes, in a nutshell, they fund both sovereign and private sector. Yes. Unless, for example, like the Inter-American Development Bank has a specific entity, just like the bank, just like the World Bank has IFC, the IDB has a specific other entity, which is called IDB Invest, which is purely focused on private sector. Whereas the African Development Bank has a private sector window, and so has the Af Asian Development Bank. So then we move into the space of international development finance institutions, where the definitions get a little bit more blurry. But um, to make it, again, comprehensive and also structured, international states, will, what we've said before, you know, they are established by sovereign states that are shareholders of these institutions. They have a development mission, a broad development mission. And they are finance institutions, so they also provide financing. But differently to the banks, they provide financing primarily in form of highly concessional terms, which Mita also alluded to earlier on, and in grant forms. So essentially, when you give a grant, a grant is an expense. You get out, you don't get it back, obviously, just like operational uh, expenditures, just like salaries. And so these institutions need continuous replenishments or capital injections by their sovereign states because they are not financially self-sustainable. A grant goes into your uh, profit and loss statement as an expense. So you're making a loss the moment you book a grant. And, and that's the, the, the big difference here, that these institutions need uh, rel um, regular capital injection from their member states because they provide highly concessional loans that are below, far below market terms and grants primarily. Now, here I've listed some of the most important international DFIs. And of course, we have IDA, which is the concessional arm of the World Bank Group. The African Development Fund, which is the concessional arm of the African Development Bank Group. The Asian Development Fund, which I should have been more specific, I've listed it here because up until seven years ago, it was just like uh, the African and the IDA. It was the development or the concessional arm of the Asian Development Bank, but now they actually merged. Then I've taken the liberty to list IFAR here as one of the most important GFIs to honor my employee. Uh, and then, of course, um, OPEC, the OPEC Fund for International Development. Then we move into national development finance institutions. So as the term implies here, these are not funded by more than one government. They are typically owned or guaranteed by one national government. So they benefit from the government guarantee or from the government ownership. And what does this in practice mean? It means that they are essentially like Mita was explaining about guarantees, they are backed by the government. So if something goes wrong, you know, they will always have the government backing them. 
which makes them a very creditworthy counterpart. In turn, this has the effect that a very creditworthy counterpart is able to access very cheap money from financial markets and use it to provide to on lend and provide cheap financing for development. Um, here we have a couple of examples. Of course, we have KFW, Credit and Chateau which basically is a credit institution for reconstruction, and it was for, um, formed in Germany as part of the Marshall Plan, actually, to reconstruct Germany again after World War II. We have Agence Française de Développement um, Proparco, which is the French development institution, which focuses on a number of aspects like health, education, um, affordable housing, uh, uh, climate, a very broad um, uh, range of development topics. We have FinDev from Canada, Sweat from, from Sweden, but as you can see here, essentially, Almost every every country has its also its national development finance institution that is of course also um, linked to the priorities of that country. So I just wanted to summarize this this first part with a, just a couple of you know key take homes. MDBs and DFIs provide financing for a broad range of development topics. They don't have a profit making mission. They are not there to make money and, you know, they're not listed on any stock exchange or something like that. They don't give out dividends. Um, MDBs and some national DFIs are banks, which provide primarily loans to make enough income to finance their ongoing operations. So to run the business and international DFIs are institutions that typically require periodic injection of capital because they are by design loss making because of the big amount of grants and concessional finance that they provide. Then we move into another space of development actors, which is very, very important. And these are the so-called vertical funds. So what is a vertical fund? So um, I said before that uh, the institutions that we just talked about focus on a number of range of development issues, whether it's climate, whether it's health, youth, education, um, access to markets, value chains, um, infrastructure. Whereas a vertical fund actually is focused on a single development domain, meaning that it's focused on a single development, primarily on a single development, let me call it problem or issue, so to speak. And here I've provided um, five examples of probably the most renowned vertical funds. So the first three, as the you know name implies, Jeff, the Global Environmental Facility, the Adaptation Fund, and the Green Climate Fund, as you can see in the term, they are focused essentially on environment. So these funds are there to help developing countries and countries in transition to meet the objectives that those countries have committed to under international environment conventions or treaties or agreements. For example, as you know, the, in the COP, you know, every country has so-called nationally determined contributions, which means how much every country commits to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. This is one of the commitments that the countries make, and these funds basically provide financing to those countries to implement projects to meet the nationally determined contributions. Or, for example, there are other commitments under the UN framework for Convention on Climate Change. And again, these funds are there to help those countries um, meet those commitments. The difference in how they work is that they are funded primarily, again, by sovereign states through replenishment exercises, but they can also be financed by the private sector, by foundations and everything. And they work with a model of accreditation. So essentially, there's a number of agencies that get accredited or, or Yes, accredited is probably the right term, to get funding from these uh, vertical funds. For example, IFAD is accredited, is a GEF accredited, and is a GCF accredited institution. What does this mean? It means that IFAD can get funds from these institutions and then use those funds to implement, actually to finance, not to implement because IFAD doesn't implement, but to finance projects in that have um, green or climate um, goals. So they work with this accreditation model. The Green Climate Fund, which is the biggest one, it's got like 200 accredited entities and it's got 11 billion assets. The Global Environmental Facility works through 16, I think 16 entities and it's hosted by the World Bank. And so that's their operating model. 
Uh, other two funds that we cannot not mention are the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And the Global Fund essentially works by um, providing financing to countries where and how those countries believe that uh, the best way is to fight these diseases. So countries make application to the Global Fund to receive Global Fund financing. And last but not least, the Gavi Alliance for, for vaccination and immunization. And simplified, what the Gavi does, it's basically putting together all the demand for vaccines, and it makes sure that the prices on the markets are lower and more accessible for some countries. So the Gavi Alliance basically finances partially the vaccines and the country finances them partially. The more the country's GNI increases, the more the country's share of the price is going to be, and the less the Gavi share. But this is, this is interesting because it shows how these vertical funds, I mean, the most important ones work. Natalia, just a quick uh, quick question there. So that's that going back to the model, the instruments talked about by Meta. This is largely um, grant funding, correct? This is correct. This is largely grant, largely grant funding or very highly concessional funding. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. And just just watching the time a little bit as well, Natalia. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know you. I know you've both got a lot to get through but yeah <laughs> so okay so we can skip the message i mean i've already said vertical funds focus on one specific development uh, um, problem now who are the members these i'm going to be very very short on this slide i just wanted to show you you know we talk about stakeholders and voting rights i just wanted to show you a picture that is a little bit old but you know you can see which are the main stakeholders of the biggest multilaterals and you can see that the us japan you know, the G7 countries are essentially the ones that contribute. But of course, the African Development Bank has a larger shareholder being Nigeria. Now, uh, the key concept here was that, you know, the shareholders are sovereign states. It's not a private entity or a private institution or Elon Musk can go there and buy shares of the, of the World Bank. So to answer your question before, you know, who are the clients of these institutions? You can see from, you know, looking at this slide that Apart from a number, a couple of exceptions, the majority of those provide financing both to sovereign states and to the private sector directly. But as I was saying before, IFC is the purely dedicated private sector arm of the World Bank, just like IDB Invest is the purely private sector dedicated arm of IDB. Um, EBRD is also 100% focused on private sector and all the rest. And this, you know, speaks to the importance of provide financing directly to the private sector. Because if you look at this picture, of, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't like that. For example, IDA opened a private sector window just two replenishments ago. IFAD opened a private sector trust fund just five years ago. So the importance of financing directly to the private sector has been increasing over, over the years. Um, yeah, the key message is that they provide financing to the public and to the private sector. I'm almost through. I just wanted to give a, a, a practical idea of the size of these institutions. So this is showing, you know, the total assets, which is a good indication of the size. You can see EIB and KFW have balance sheets of almost 600 billion. Um, IBRD has almost 350 billion. Um, and they are sizable institutions. Of course, you cannot compare them with commercial banks. Why is that? Because commercial banks have huge balance sheets that go into trillions because you know they take deposits and they are a completely different business model. But I just wanted to show you the relative size of these institutions in terms of their assets. Another measure of the size of an institution is basically how much they disburse every year, you know, for the development projects. You can see EAB, that's last year's data, has been increasing its disbursements by more than 50 billion, almost reaching 60 billion. IBRD disburses something like 25 billion. But you can see also that national development finance institutions like KFW really, really develop uh, deliver a lot of financing on the ground. We've talked a little bit about this. This is how they actually work. There are the development finance institution and MDBs, depending on, on the spectrum of concessionality where they operate, but essentially they have two forms of, of capital, which you know Mita already talked about, equity from member states or capital through replenishment, however you want to call it, and borrowing. 
borrowing from financial markets or from bilaterals. With the equity and capital, they of course provide the grants and the concessional loans, whereas they can use the borrowing from financial markets to provide less concessional loans. They both also keep some liquidity to make investments. The liquidity that is there is typically parked pending disbursements. And then they get the reflux from the, from the loans that they give. Um, you can see the main message that I wanted to show here is that uh, the majority of the big players, the MDBs, are all AAA rated, which is the highest possible rating. You know, they're rated higher than the majority of the countries that they give money to, but also like look at Italy's rating, of course. <laughs> so uh, as I was saying before, what is, the, what is the implication of this? Is that they can access uh, um, financing on financial markets at very, very, very con uh, good terms. And this is the whole model of NDBs, accessing mar financial um, funding on financial markets at very good terms and on lending to countries that wouldn't be able to access those terms if they were to face financial markets directly. Um, just a word about um, hybrid capital, because talking about innovations, this is something that you would have heard about. The African Development uh, Bank was spearheading this, and I'm full of admiration for them. Um, they worked intensively of issuing on issuing hybrid capital, which Mita um, hin uh, hinted about uh, before. As the term implies, issuing hybrid capital meaning issuing capital that has an element of a bond, and in fact, it has a coupon rate that they pay on this capital, but it also has an element of equity, which is basically the fact that there's no fixed maturity. This is our perpetual capital. So it's not that they issue capital and like a bond, you know, they have to pay it back. It's perpetual and they pay a coupon, which is a bond feature. And now um, there's many other MDBs that are actually um, following that path as well, because issuing hybrid capital and having that capital recognizes equity by the rating agencies then essentially allows you to lend more. Do I still have time, Jim, for the recommendations of the G20? You tell me. Yeah, just, just very briefly, if you don't mind, but we can also yeah. come back to discuss it a little bit more in the discussion session. Okay, so in two minutes, basically, there's been a, a, a very long and very deep exercise by the G20 and looking at the MDB's reforms. And the whole goal of the exercise was to make sure that the MDBs could lend more, you know, boosting MDBs investment capacity. And so they came up with five recommendations, which I don't have time to go through now, but I'd be very happy if anybody's interested later on in the question and answers. You know, they came out with five recommendations and the whole goal of these recommendations is essentially for the MDBs to be a bit more risk taker, you know, leverage a little bit more the balance sheet and essentially lend more, deliver more financing on the ground. So I'm going to stop here and very happy to take any questions. Fantastic, thank you so much, Natalia. That was really, really, really clear and super valuable. Uh, maybe just while you catch your breath, maybe I can ask Mita to answer one of these questions here that was about um, concessional financing. So maybe you might like to just um, unwrap a little bit what we mean by concessional financing. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can take that one and then the blended one as well, uh, although Natalia might want to uh, add to that. Um, the The question was, what do we mean by concessional financing? So essentially, concessional financing is cheap money, cheaper than what the market will provide. And if you take the examples that Natalia provided on how the um, IDA and uh, the A Asian and African development banks provide concessional financing, it's usually in the form of either cheaper interest rates or the terms are, are less commercial. So for example, they provide grace periods so countries don't have to start paying interest for five years or seven years, whatever's agreed with the bank. Um, so cheaper interest rates, less commercial terms, and, and critically, longer tenors than you would otherwise find in the market. And typical long tenors in the market tend to be around seven years uh, in the non-infrastructure space, whereas IDA can provide up to 25 years for, for lending, which, which is really helpful, particularly for um, sovereign lending. So that's what the definition of concessionality is. Uh, Jim, do you want me to take this kind of question about the difference between blend and hybrid? Blended yeah, and that would be great. Um, so I think 
Natalia, tell me if I've got this right, but my understanding of the difference is blended finance is when you blend commercial capital and and development finance concessional capital. That blending of the commercial and the public together is what blended finance is, and you can blend in lots of different ways. Hybrid capital, in my understanding, is how the MDB, it's a specific term with respect to how the MDBs are starting to raise more capital on their balance sheet. In the past, they would get pure equity financing from governments in the form of um, uh, uh, capital. Now, because donors are also starting to have budget constraints, significant budget constraints, particularly since uh, COVID, um, this hybrid is a hybrid between a pure equity injection and a, and a, and a debt. It's like a mezzanine a structure, which basically means that it looks like equity and it talks like equity, but it's actually debt. Um, but Natalia, tell me if I've got that wrong. No, you got it perfectly. It looks like equity, but it's actually debt, but it's not 100% debt because, as you know, debt, you have to repay back at some term, at some point, whereas these are perpetual structures. So essentially, they don't have a maturity, but it looks like that because they pay interest. But the most important thing and the most important work that the African Development Bank spearheaded was these lengthy conversations that they had with the rating agencies before issuing hybrid capital because they wanted to make sure that even if that capital has an element of debt, it's still recognized 100% as equity when the rating agencies assess the bank. Why is that important? Because, of course, you issue hybrid and your equity increases. And what does that mean? You can leverage more. You know, you can borrow more and you can lend more. So uh, once finally the rating agencies, after lengthy discussions, gave the okay that hybrid capital would have been considered 100% like equity, that was really the game changer. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, maybe a question to both of you, and please, audience, if you have any other questions, uh, do put them in the chat. This whole issue of if we look at the agriculture sort of food security rural development area, we're dealing with a lot of very small enterprises. And of course, a lot of the loans that are given by IFIs are often on, on very large scale. So just a little bit of a thought on how do you actually match the needs of small scale enterprises in the agri food sector with how the whole financing structure is working? And I think some of that's also got to the, do with the question here about, you know, are there ways of providing more concessional finance to private sector to get more of the social good uh, that you want out of out of their investments? Mita, if you want, I can I can start and then you can complement. So, no, you raise a very important point. Actually, I mean, just to give you a level of magnitude, while the average loan from IFAD is 40 million USD, the average loan from the World Bank is 300 million USD to the public sector. So the first answer to this for me is essentially what I've said we started to doing, lending directly to the private sector. You know, since IFA opened a private sector trust fund, you see that, of course, the loans to the private sector, for the reason that you explained, are much smaller. We're talking about five million, two and a half million. So lending directly to the private sector, while on the other hand, you know, reduces the volume, it also addresses a, a need that couldn't have been addressed by giving, you know, 100 million loans. That is the first thing that, that would come to my mind. And then, of course, I think, Mita, over to you. I mean, you've provided a lot of examples about how um, MDBs can actually make the private sector palatable for other investors. You know, when there is a name like the World Bank or somebody guaranteeing something for the private sector, it's not only the fact that they guarantee the financing, but it also has an effect of confidence on the market that would help, you know, other private investors get on board. I don't know, Mita, if you would confirm this. Yeah, I agree. I think this this is it's it's a term called the halo effect. Uh, you know, where the MDVs coming into into a transaction or into a market creates this halo effect, and private investors say, "Oh, well, if the World Bank is there." We know we're kind of protected. And that's actually why, for example, MIGA, which is part of the World Bank that provides insurance and particularly political risk insurance, you know, is so much in demand because private investors say it's not just the insurance product. It's the fact that the bank is coming in. And we know that the bank has, by virtue of its shareholding, 
of all these governments um, a huge amount of clout and able to address certain issues as they come up without having to resort to the rule of law or to to um, to legal system. But the specific question about how do you actually get money flowing to SMEs is a really good, really challenging question, which I can see in this ag space is, is really pertinent. I mean, I think this is one of the biggest challenges because the DFIs, the MDBs, and in many respects, donors as well, are large organizations with big balance sheets. And to spend money well in small ticket sizes requires an absolutely huge workforce and presence on the ground. And there isn't a way to do that without massively increasing your costs and changing the way that the business models work of these banks and these DFIs. And so in many ways, in my there's really three ways to do this. And it's partly through what we call intermediation in, in the financial sector, which is you give money to someone else who then gives money to the SMEs um, because you can't go directly to them. And yes, it increases the costs and the friction in the system, but it also creates more jobs. Uh, and it creates more um, uh, avenues through which your money can go through. So um, Natalia mentioned accredited institutions. Well, these accredited institutions don't necessarily spend the money themselves. They then go out and look for NGOs, public sectors, private sector agencies to help um, them access these big pots of money like the Green Climate Fund, for example. And in the blended finance space, you usually find three ways to intermediate. So uh, say a DFI, um, uh, a KFW says, okay, but well, we want to get more lending down to more money down to women backed SMEs in the ag sector. Well, it's rather than it, it going out there to look for these SMEs, that what it will go and provide, look for three types of entities. One, a bank. Banks operate in these countries, they have branches all over, and they have, have the tools through which to access, to, um, you know, kind of. On, uh, um, smaller parts of the economy, smaller en um, um, in, um, enterprises in the economy. So the KFW will give a gender loan to a bank, let's say Standard Bank, which operates in Africa. Standard Bank will then go out to all its clients and uh, advertise wide in the markets, in the rural areas, in the small cities, and say, look, we've got loans that we can provide to, and these terms, to women-led enterprises. And so that's one way, which is a very... Um, common way to, to for the DFIs and the MDBs to provide financing to SMEs. The other is through funds, which is a similar model where you have fund managers who have a specific strategy. It could be an SME debt strategy. It could be a ag strategy, whatever the strategy is. And the DFIs then fund them. They go out and find the transactions. And then the third is partnerships. And this is starting to be recognized as a really important tool. This is mostly around public-private partnerships with NGOs and others, um, where financiers, commercial businesses and NGOs can partner to affect, to try and come up with a solution to a problem in a particular area or particular market. And there's pros and cons to this. These are different institutions which have very different objectives and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But in my view, it's still an underutilized mode of, of operating. Great, thanks thanks so much, both of you. Um, I'm watching time here, here again. So much to say around all of this. It's uh, it's quite challenging, but great. There was two really, really clear overviews of the whole financing sector. So I think with that, we will have a little bit more time to come to some more questions and discussion at the end. But Marco, I think we should come back to you. So what does this whole financing story mean for achieving SDG 2? Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, to Mita and Natalia for, for the excellent presentation. And actually, they, they helped actually set the stage for what I want to say right now. Uh, definitely, it, I mean, we have we have three facts here, maybe four. We have big problems in the world, like food insecurity and malnutrition, that's a fact. We know what are the solutions from the perspective of the pathways, the policies, the legislation changes that you need and the investments. And we also know that based on what Natalia and Anita have brilliantly explained, I mean, there is, there is a supply of of, of capital and financing out there. There are banks, there are different agents. And there's also an array of instruments that we can think of. So then if we have all these, the question is, why do we have this problem, right? And, and basically, uh, this is what the Soviet report tries to, to respond uh, um, in, 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 in this year's edition. Uh, so let me just explain a little bit, uh, based on all this knowledge that you have been able to, to acquire today, what you can expect from the SOFI 2024 report 
that can uh, feed into the discussions on the intersection of donor coordination and finance for food systems and rural development. Uh, so the SOFI report this year uh, very clearly sends, uh, sends a message which, which is you know, well known by, by, by all of us. More financing will be needed if we want to be on track uh, towards meeting the, the SDG targets of eradicating hunger and food insecurity and also malnutrition in all their forms. And uh, the SOFI reminds us that there is an SDG, which is uh, number 17, uh, Sustainable Development Goal 17, that speaks about the means of implementation. Uh, and the means of implementation, uh, as, as it regards the SOFI report, that are key are two. One is financing, and the other one is financial inclusion. Now, uh, you know, what is interesting is that everybody is speaking about more financing for several things, more financing for rural development, more financing for uh, transforming uh, food systems. And now we talk about more financing for uh, food security and nutrition. However, what we know in the SOFI, as you will see, is that there are no clear definitions, you know? What is a clear definition of financing for food systems transformation? Is there such definition? What is a clear definition of financing for rural development? Probably that one is a little, a little clearer to us. But what is a clear definition of financing for food security and nutrition? Well, we find out in, in the Soviet that there was no such thing as a clear definition. Therefore, the different knowledge that is being generated, you know, moves in different directions, you know, with some very different estimates of, uh, you know, what is needed to achieve certain goals when there is not a clear definition. Uh, so the SOFI tackled the issue of financing, uh, concretely financing to end hunger, food insecurity, and all forms of malnutrition. Uh, now, uh, what SOFI does is, uh, you know, it provides some idea of the current levels and gaps in financing for food security and nutrition, and also provide guidance on innovative financing options to address, you know, the main causes of food insecurity and malnutrition. And many of the things we try to talk about there are precisely uh, within the discussion that we had before we Natalia and Nita on, on, on what is out there to, to, to finance development. Now, just a heads up, the SOFI report uh, on 15 July, there will be a special event uh, on the thing of financing uh, at the high level political forum in New York. Uh, basically, we will be the four, the five agencies that are publishing the SOFI report will be talking about the theme. Uh, uh, so we invite you all to connect to that because we will be speaking about uh, the financing for food security and nutrition. But the official launch of the SOFI report will be on 24 July. Uh, it will be launched at the, at the G20 Global Alliance Against Hunger and Poverty Task Force Ministerial Meeting in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and of course, after the launch, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, you know our discussions uh, within this platform will, will pay attention to the SOFI as, as it can really inform uh, uh, what is around the intersection of donor coordination and finance for food systems and rural development. Now, one of the contributions of the SOFI to, 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 to give you a heads up is the new definition. Uh, I think this is an important step. That definition was not there. And we really wish that people start paying attention to that definition uh, so that we all harmonize the estimates of food sector of, of financing for food security and nutrition. We provide not only a new definition for food security and nutrition financing, but also the guidance or, and the protocols for how to uh, apply that definition to the different flows of financing that are out there, both uh, uh, domestic and also foreign. Uh, both public and also private. Uh, so as you will notice in the SOFI report, to do this, to have a definition, you, you have to go, uh, you are uh, shift away from the typical, you know, sectoral definition of agriculture financing, but you go beyond that and you need to take into account, you know, the multidimensional nature of food insecurity and malnutrition. Uh, now, uh, uh, very importantly, when we are trying to apply this new definition to the to the different financing flows, uh, we we find very interesting aspects uh, that uh, relate to data, data constraints. So the SOFI will really also answer the question: Do we really have the information, the accounting 
systems and frameworks available to apply such definition of food security and nutrition financing to really understand how much financing there is available in the world to tackle the problems of food insecurity and nutrition, and also how much additional financing may be needed from now until 2030. Now, uh, the definition is very interesting because uh, actually contains two definitions in itself. Uh, one is the core definition of financing, and this one actually is the one that maps financing to the issues of food availability, food access, food utilization and stability, which are the pillars of uh, food security as we know them. So this is the financing that actually goes to the different actors to tackle those problems, but as also the financing that helps improve the health status of people, basically the caring and feeding practices and the health services and environmental health, for example, water and sanitation and things like that. So that is a core definition. But as you, if you remember the first uh, part of my presentation before, before uh, we discussed the financing aspects themselves, I talked about uh, Sophie over the years identifying the, the drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition. So I talk about you know conflict, climate, variability and extremes, economic slowdown, and affordability of healthy diet, persisting inequalities. So the new definition adds an extended part of it, which is the standard definition of food security and nutrition financing. And that one is important because we have to add to the usual you know, necessities to improve food consumption. We also need to add you know, how much it will cost to transit to the pathways that you know, we know exist and are necessary to address the major drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition. And that's very important because this basically gives us the opportunity to start linking things up. For example, if climate extremes and climate variability are a driver of food insecurity and malnutrition, here the definition start paying attention also to some issues regarding climate financing, for example. So then it is very important, even though the definition is not a fully fledged definition of financing food systems transformation, it is a definition that is specifically maps up financing needs with both the pillars of food insecurity and nutrition and malnutrition and the drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition. So with that definition, you know, the SOFI responds critical questions that I bet when we have the answers after the launch, uh, we can enrich our discussions in this forum. One is how much of international financing flows or official flows is actually supporting food security and nutrition. And based on this, the SOFI responds to the question, can food security and nutrition be considered a high priority for donors based on these flows? That's an important question for this forum, for this discussion. Are international official flows targeting well the countries where hunger, food insecurity, and undernutrition are higher? That's a key question that we answer in the SOFI report. But we also look at how you know, governments are spending as well, because that's a source of domestic financing. And we go over the trends and try to understand, you know, if public spending for food security and nutrition is low or high in low and middle income countries. Uh, now, for all these flows that the SOFI report looks at, we also try to understand how much of those flows goes to the food consumption and health part of food, of food security and nutrition, which is the core definition versus that part that is going to addressing the major drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition, which are climate, economic slowdown, conflicts, and so on and so forth, which relates to the extended definition. And we are also trying to understand what is happening with private flows for food security and nutrition, which may be the most important to think about in this framework. And we try to understand which private flows are really trackable or not trackable to apply this new definition of financing for food security and nutrition. Uh, two more slides to understand what is coming. Two questions that are critical are, are countries most in need of more financing, easily accessing financing for food security and nutrition? That's a critical question we try to answer in this software report. And which are the, the most adequate financing tools depending on the ability of countries to access financing. 
So this is very relevant to what Mita and Natalia were talking about. You know, we have a supply uh, of financing, we have instruments, but the SOFI report provides a typology of countries depending on their ability to access financing. Some of them we have limited ability, some of them moderate, and some of them high. And importantly, in the SOFI report, there is a mapping of disability and the different levels of food insecurity and malnutrition in these countries. How much these countries are being affected by the main drivers of food insecurity and malnutrition? How much are there? Are, are there? Uh, 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 how, how, how much are there? They being affected by climate extreme. You know. So we map that up, and we also map that up to the cost of implementing financing tools. So basically, what the SOFI report does at the end of the day is, depending on this typology of countries, you will have a number of instruments that are more or can be more tailored to these country typologies. So many of the instruments that Mita was talking about, you know, could be used in one setting of a country with limited ability versus a setting where there is high ability to access financing. So the instrument that we will use to tackle food insecurity and malnutrition in the future will depend on this typology of countries. Last but not least, uh, the question that we answer at the end is, uh, does the current financing architecture for food security and nutrition support the increase of financing to meet the SDG to targets? Uh, and what we try to understand here is very important issues of this architecture, the fragmentation, the absence of data that is not really allowing us to have a clear picture of the gaps, the lack of coordination, in the architecture, and sometimes also the misaligned alignment of you know priorities between the donor's priorities and the country's priorities. And at the end of the day, based on all this assessment, SOFI recommends uh, concrete actions for addressing the challenges and building a supportive financing architecture for food security and nutrition. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you so much. Marco, and I think you know, I think that was a really interesting compliment to what we he heard from Mita and Natalia because, I mean, they were talking about the finance side, but if you want finance to develop social and environmental goods, you've got to really understand what those goods are, how they work and what they need. So I think that this report is clearly providing a very, very good insight into that other end of the whole whole financing story. Look, everybody, we've got a we've got another 20 minutes. Um, so, you know, we're really open to questions and, and discussion now. So, I mean, feel free to put any more questions in the question box, um, in the chat box, uh, or also just to raise your hand if you'd like to ask something. But I think what I'd like to do is to come back to all three of you just to, to kick us off is big picture, what's working and what's not working in this whole finance story. Who would like Natalia? Do you want to kick us no, off? You, you, you <laughs> had a bit of a laugh and a big smile there, Natalia. So, you know, <laughs> give us your couple of things that you think are working well and the couple of things you think really need some big reform. So, uh, that's a tough one. So, what I think is working better, I wouldn't say that it's working yet as well as it should and i will be talking about the world that i'm in every every day which is you know the dfi ifi and the world um, the collaboration is working better but we could streamline so much on the on the let me call it like the operational side uh, we could we could have joint frameworks which we started having joint frameworks for procurement joint frameworks i mean it's it's these little things that are maybe not so flashy but they make the collaboration on a day-to-day -day basis, joint frameworks for co-financing. Um, all of these would drastically, I think, reduce the time of having two or three organizations working together. And I've seen this in real life. So we really need to streamline uh, the essential, let me call them governance documents that govern the operations. That is, I think, a must. Because, uh, you know, IFAD, for example, co-finances a lot with colleagues that are also with institutions who I've seen also participate to the, to the call with bigger sisters, um, like the World Bank, the African, the Asian. 
Um, we have we, we have financing from EAB. We have financing from KFW. What what makes it incredibly complex is the different kind of policies that we all have, and that's one thing that we started seeing recognized because we start signing joint something, you know, joint procurement frameworks, joint here, joint there. But there's there's a lot, a lot that I think could be done in this in this area. Yeah. Um, I could go on, but I I'm okay. Let's let, very... let's 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 get a reaction from um, yeah. Meta and Marco. So I mean, I I fully fully agree with that, Natalia. I I would add another little thing which could have an outsized impact is data on the private sector side. You know, investors make decisions based on data. The people who hold the most data, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin, on investing in these countries are the MDBs and DFIs. If they were to share that data, it would have a huge, the good and the bad and the ugly, all of it, it would have an outsize. The other two things I think, I, I would have two more things I think I would love to see working better. One is um, the more and more I engage in this space, the more I see everybody's chasing the same things in the middle of the stack. So if you imagine that the uh, financing world is a bit like an escalator. You have people that join the escalator and then it kind of travels up and then you get off the escalator at the top. And I feel like all the DFIs chase the same deals which are in the middle of the escalator. They're kind of relatively economically, financially sound, large tickets, relatively risk averse, etc. But there's so much more to do in particular in sectors like infrastructure, agribusiness, agri um, adaptation, resilience, etc., on feeding the pipeline. Who amongst us in this entire development finance community is responsible for making sure that there is a pipeline of businesses coming up to an earlier question about SMEs. SMEs need to grow. They need to grow to become big contributors to the economy and big job creators. But how do, who's helping them grow to become, get to the point at which DFIs can then, you know, they're then investable. So one, who's feeding the escalator? And at the top of the escalator, we need exits. We need people to help exit. Once you invest, you still need to exit. And the exit market is broken, particularly in Africa. So I think if I, if, you know, if I had a magic wand, I would love for the DFIs to take a stand back view and say, it's not just focus on deals. Look at the entire system and see where we need to plug gaps and who the best people are to address this. Fantastic. Thanks, Meter. I, I mean, I'm assuming that's also a really important message for donors of saying, if you want to be more catalytic, how can you really think about what you can be doing at that bottom end of the escalator, which is you know, a different mm -hmm. mixture of things and perhaps largely grant stuff that's often happened at that at that bottom end, I think. Uh, Marco, oh, sorry, yeah. go uh, respond, Meta. Yeah. No, I was going to say yes, but I also I guess there's a touch of um, caution there because we have often, as donors, got it wrong. I say we with my ex-FCDO hat on. We've often got it wrong because sometimes you use grant as the wrong instrument to build, yeah. you know, investment propositions, and 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 grant is not a tool to build investment yeah. propositions, and and so you can get it wrong. <laughs> Great, thanks, Meta. Marka. Well, I mean, let me let me start with the issue of data. I fully agree with you, Meta. I mean, data we cannot take for granted. But there is a lot of data. There is a lot of data, but is there access to such data? Is there proper, you know, accounting of things? I'm not sure about that. But and Jim, I think donors can play a great role in helping us, you know, establish data systems, data dashboards of what they are contributing to the system, right? So on data, uh, basically, one of the important things that that in the software report you will see is that. Uh, you know, once you solve, solve the issue of definitions and you can properly apply definitions to data, you will have two things that are going to be very useful going forward. One is you take the stock of what you have, right? And I will tell you why that is very important, taking the stock of what you have. And then you, you have to estimate gaps. How much additional funding do I need for achieving my objective, right? Now, what we're finding out, and this is a, a heads up of what is coming in this software report, is that with the existing color resources, there is a lot of space to use the resources better. Meaning, even though, though there is financing available, we may not be using it in the best way possible in some cases. Mm -hmm. You may recall this discussion, Jim and colleagues, that uh, about repurposing public support, right? So in the software report, you will see there is a special box where, you know, for several sub-Saharan countries, we take the public domestic public finance, basically uh, the budgets of a few, few countries, 
-hmm. And we try to optimize the way they are using this financing. And we find out that with the same way of, with the same budget, but spending it differently, more smart across agricultural investment areas and across different subsectors, you know, with the same money, they can really reduce poverty in millions mm -hmm. and afford and make that millions afford healthy diets with the same budget. So a yeah. key message is, are we using the current financing in the way that we should? I think we have to think about that also before advocating, you know, like blindly for more financing. And the second point is, uh, how do we align agendas? How do we align agendas so that donors, you know, get some clarity? I give you the example. We are talking here about financing for food security and nutrition, or financing for rural development, or financing for agri food systems transformation. It turns out that for all these three, climate is a big elephant in the room, right? And the climate financing agenda may not be properly connected. So I think a, a key issue to be discussed is, okay, how do we make donors talk to each other so that these agendas are aligned because they cannot be disconnected, you know? I yeah. cannot achieve food security if I don't tackle climate financing, for example. Yeah. Great, thanks, Marco. And I think that brings me back to one of the questions that was raised earlier on, which if I understand it correctly, was just around the big market outlooks and directions. So as all this development financing, trying to pull a system, you know, that's shifting, going completely the opposite direction in terms of equity and environmental issues with not a great deal of success? Or do you see that actually this sort of development financing actually happened, has tremendous potential to trigger markets to move in a different direction that is much more environmentally supportive and, and, and socially responsible? So... <laughs> It's a, it's a big question, you know. It is a it is a big question, and I'm assuming that's what the participant was was asking. But I think mean, I think I think that there are you know there are experiences from country to country. Uh, yeah. You, Natalia, you may have seen you know some operations uh, from IFA, you know, providing excellent results, and maybe the very same operation not working in some other environments. I mean, I mean, the key issue is you know how do we how do we come up with a manual? a protocol, you know, that can be flexible enough to adapt to the different circumstances, you know? I don't think nobody contests, Jim, the, 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 the different priorities that you have to factor in at the same time, you know? But in financing, Amita, you are, you are more an expert on this than I am. Some instruments will work well, depending on the context, depending on the yeah. governments, depending yeah. on, you know, what are the drivers of food insecurity? Yeah. So, yeah. so I think we, we have to start really taking good stock of lessons as well, what has worked out in certain contexts and why this very same policy or instrument hasn't worked out in some other context, yeah. you know? So it's a big discussion and, and, and I think that donors can be very instrumental in helping us, you know, to also, you know, share their experiences. Yeah. They know very well what has worked well in their, in their portfolios yeah. and what okay. has not Great, thanks, Mark. I mean, maybe back, Mitra and Natalia, to you. Um, one question here seems to be around debt overall. And I think, you know, the issue around countries carrying large levels of debt and the implications of, of that and how that feeds into the whole financing story. And I think the other one is around uh, how do you build solid local financial institutions within within countries? So maybe both of you might like to, to react to those uh, two areas a little bit. Sure, maybe I can say a few words about that. I mean, uh, that is indeed a, a huge issue, um, level of debt rise in, in, in these countries. And of course, there's also policies that say that if a country is, you know, as raised as um, there's this traffic light system by the IMF, right? If a country is in debt distress, that country is only eligible for grants. For example, IFA and all the other MDBs subscribe to the DSF, the debt sustainability mechanism, whereby uh, some countries just simply, you cannot lend to them, you have to give them a grant. Um, which then, of course, goes back to the point, how you do, how do you fund these grants? Because these are expenses, you know, and they have to be funded again from member states' contributions. They can't be funded by issuing bonds because otherwise you run it a lot. Um, one thing that was also in the chat that, that would certainly help is if um, we were to develop more local currency lending. 
Of course, you know, if these institutions are hooked on, on, on loans in hard currencies like USDs and euros, you know, they will be continuing, we will be perpetuating this system whereby they are depending on financing and having to pay back loans that are not in their own currencies, basically taking the effects risk, which is huge. So I think one way for sure that we need to scale up is to scale up mechanisms for local currency lending, both at sovereign level as well as 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 to the private sector directly. What was the second question? I'm pretty sure Mitra Mita will be best placed. Well, <laughs> I think you covered both of them a bit. So that's yeah, Mita. You did you already. Yeah, I think let me just add because I think um I I think like Natalia and, and Marco have answered um really well both those questions and also that initial very broad question about you know, um, uh, how do you, you know, basically is capitalism failing and do we really want to transpose it to developing countries? And it, my, my view on, on that really big question, a really important question as well for us to reflect on is um, you don't get scale in any country in any part of the globe without the power of capital markets and private sector. Like we just cannot do this ourselves. And even if we try, we will never get to the scale in enough time, um, you know, particularly in the climate challenge. So scale is really important. But how we work with the private sector, where we mobilize them and, and how thoughtfully we catalyze them so that we demonstrate to them using grant funding, we demonstrated where there are opportunities. That's all in our gift. And, and, and that's why the use of concessional financing to mobilize private sector, which has been around for you know more than a decade now, it just requires a lot more thought and targeting. Um, and we went through a period where we were seeding and funding everything with concessional financing, and it had led to propping up sectors, the use of private finance in the in, in the wrong places, et cetera. So that thoughtful use of concessionality is critical. And then linked to that, there's a question on local capital markets. Look, I think we've not talked, in the context of the discussions we have been having as a global development community on mobilizing capital, we've not given enough thought and enough focus on mobilizing domestic players. Uh, there is some great instruments that exist in the ecosystem, particularly from the MDBs and DFIs, to look at how you can deploy more local currency. And that's great. But there are also local pools of capital, local pension funds, local insurance companies. In Africa, I saw a stat, and I hope this is correct because I'm quoting it, but I, I, you know, $2 trillion worth of assets under management by African institutional investors. That is a deep capital pool in Africa. Currently, most of that is being deployed in safe fixed income assets like treasury bonds. A lot, you know, how do you mobilize that, you know, high, uh, very risk averse capital for productive use on the continent? Why not target blended finance for those kind of objectives in addition to trying to mobilize global institutional investors? Because that's local currency capital, which can be deployed for local currency. Take out the FX problem straight away with that. Uh, and then you deepen the capital markets. There are a lot of institutions that are doing great work on this, like FSD Africa and others. But I think more, more thought and more money is needed for this agenda. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mita. And um one of my colleagues in, in the Secretariat has just sent me a ping saying five minutes left. So, um, <laughs> but look, it's really been a fantastic discussion input. Maybe just a couple of quick questions that I can still see here in the in the chat box. Um, one is, uh, well, we've been talking about it a little bit, but I mean, how do you close this finance gap for small scale farmers? And that also, I think, links a little bit to where different sorts of financing mechanisms work at different points in the value chain, particularly around de-risking. I think should I should I? Yeah, have a have a have a. Have a I know you're not an expert on on the agriculture sector, yeah. but I'm sure you've got a few ideas around this whole issue of many many small players and how you can actually help to finance them in a more efficient and effective way without too many intermediaries. Yeah, so I think I think there's two things. One is I don't think you can get away without intermediaries, but I also intermediaries don't necessarily have to be high admin cost intermediaries. So one of the tools that have been around in the ag space for a while on private sector financing for smallholders is like DevCo. I would classify them as an intermediary, uh, but they do some really interesting work testing innovative financing models for smallholder farmers. But another one, and again, we don't really 
I think talk about this is enough, is that there are, again, I know Africa well, so I'll talk about Africa, but for example, in the East Africa market, quite a lot of small, medium, and particularly medium and large local businesses in the ag sector who naturally know the market so well, but they're not currently um, growing at a significant scale. But if they were to grow with development capital in a way that they can deepen their supply chains with smallholder farmers, I think that would be a good commercial win, a good development win. So I think with smallholder farmers and the kind of challenges around last mile, access, last mile distribution, last mile um, supply chains. It's such a tricky thing, but that's where local capacity really helps because the local knowledge is there to help you access these really tricky, tricky. Um, yeah, that's 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 a very generic comment for a sector, which I know is very um, is very complex. <laughs> but, but I think some I think some nice insights there. Look, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Okay. Um, maybe okay. Natalia or Marco, if you've just got you know one very quick last comment from anything you've seen in the chats or anything you've heard so far, and then we'll wrap up. I just had literally one last thought to complement what what Nita was was saying. You know about smallholder farmers, we need. I mean, IFA tries as well and does it, but we need to have them higher up on the agenda of the government. That's the point. You know, it's very it's very easy to sell a uh, highway, you know, but sometimes uh, the needs and this is why policy dialogue and sitting at the table is very, very important. Having institutions that have expertise in this actually uh, being at the deciding table and making sure that the interests and the needs of local farmers are reflected in rules, regulations, down to implementation. And that's because that's how things change from the country itself, you know, and, and that I think is key. We have to in, in, insist and invest on policy dialogue and enhancing the needs. We have the statistics. They produce what half the world calories and they cannot make a life for themselves. So I'm going to just stop with this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, yeah. um, thank you, Natalia, Mita and, and Marco for a really fascinating session. I've, I've just really, really enjoyed listening to what you've uh, all been saying. I think this really underpins the value of the annual General Assembly for the Global Donor Platform this, this coming, coming year. Um, and I think with that, I can um, also thank all the audience that's been with us. We realise it's been a long session, but of course, a lot of material to cover. We will be recording this and making it available to others as well, or maybe some that had to drop off after an hour. Um, so thanks for the questions. And I think I can hand it back to you to, to wrap us up, uh, Maurizio. Thanks, Jim. I will be extremely brief. Uh, I mean, I, 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 there's really not much to our presentation. It was sharp, clear, comprehensive. The material we'll share online would undoubtedly be a valuable resource for the development community helping everybody navigate the financing space more effectively. You know, a contribution, an additional contribution to the financing debate in ag, food security, nutrition, food systems. We've been trailed by, by with the depth and substance of the information, and it's impressive how much we managed to cover in just two hours. That's really, really impressive. And uh, uh, really, again, special thanks to Natalia, Meet, and Marco for being with us. Thanks to you, Jim, for the amazing moderation and facilitation and my colleagues in the Secretariat for having organized and communicating the, the, the meeting so well. We'll follow up with additional events on financing for food and ag, leading up to our General Assembly, so please stay tuned. Looking forward to seeing all of you again soon. Bye-bye.